I'm here at Holcomb National Nature Reserve. And I first came here in the 1970s as a student. And I remember people saying, well, this shouldn't be arable fields as it was then, and shouldn't be intensive uh, pasture, but should be restored back to the wetland that this area quite clearly once was. And the Holcomb Estate have been busy doing this. And I'm here with Andy Bloomfield, who's their nature reserve warden. So, so tell me, Andy, what's, uh, what's happened here? What's, what, why is this different? What have you done to restore it? So in the, um, up until the early 1980s, the grazing marshes as we know them today were, were far, far drier. Uh, highly grazed, as you said, intensively grazed. Um, the potential was always recognised um, that it could be a wetland of, of great importance for nature, birds in particular. So the Nature Conservancy Council, who were managing it alongside Holcomb Estate in the 1980s, had been a nature reserve since 1967, but this was a neglected part of that nature reserve. The, 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 the impetus was always on the sand dunes and the pine woods and the beach nesting birds. So there was, for 20 years, there was this period where all these fields, which were part of the nature reserve, were just very dry um, and um, not used by any of the birds that you would associate with it if it was a wetland. So the idea was to make them wet again. Um, so this, a, a great plan was devised um, and uh, along the coast between Burnham Overy, Burnham Norton, Holcomb and Wells, it's all Holcomb Estate land, all bits, of, most of it are part of the nature reserve. And the idea was to hold back the water through provisions of, of clay buns initially to hold the water which ordinarily escapes and went out to sea at wells next to sea. There's a, um, a chalk uh, spring fed system that puts water naturally into the ditches. Which is why the water is so beautiful here. Uh, very clear in the ditches behind us that you'll have probably seen Bill. But anyway, um, the, the water is fed into the ditches from, from these springs and ordinarily stretches, uh, follows the, the ditch levels all the way down to wells. So, so it would go all the way out here, uh, naturally. And these, these initially were old salt marshes. There were sea banks uh, made in the 1700s and 1800s, and they essentially starved these fields of, of salt water. They were grazed, and then some of them, as you said, were farmed and, uh, with arable and also mixed livestock. Um, so in these fields, there are all these old remnant creeks that were there when that was a salt marsh which were essentially for many, many years were left dry, high and dry, without the, without the flow of salt water. So the first thing that was done in the, eight, in the 1980s was to create bunds to hold back the water from escaping. And then there would be inlets uh, dug from the ditch to these lows in the fields, some, some of the natural lows from the old salt marsh creeks, some such as this was a field low that was actually then scraped out with machinery to make a, a, a bigger wetland feature like we see here. And then we have a provision of, a, of an elbowed um, pipe which, which allows us to regulate the flow of fresh water from the ditches into the feature that you see. So if I push that down like that... All the, the water gushes in. The, the ditch levels are a, a, a high level at the moment because we've had rain recently, we had 15 millimetres of, of rain the last two or three days. So the ditch levels have gone up, the springs, spring system has been reinvigorated and the rainfalls help. So the, the ditch level's high, so we can flow the water quite easily to, to, to fill these features up if we want to. But as you'll see, the, the water level's already quite high. It looks like a lake. Mm -hmm. But this time of the year, late July, going into August, we really want to see wet mud for, for wading birds that are migrating through. And also if there's any late broods of avocets, lapwings or red shanks, uh, the wet mud is very important for invertebrates. So we'll so, stop doing that. That's so just we'll stop doing for, that because we don't want to make things the worse for them. Yeah, yeah, okay, right. yeah great. So for me to, to actually drain this big feature here, we would then have to take sluice boards out further along the system closer to, and, to wells. And, and then sluice boards at the far end near about, those trees? I yeah, about, about half a mile away there's a, a sluice and then there's another sluice further on and then there's an, an ultimate one near wells. And then the sluice is a ditch and then you have a series of boards that yeah, block the Yeah, again, way. so we can regulate the height of the water in the ditches. We, By taking we, out a board. If we take, if we take 
five boards out, we'd, we'd, drop, we'd drop the ditch levels dramatically. We'd never want to do that. Uh, so we usually govern it all on a board that's about that much. And that's usually, you know, a 20 centimetre discrepancy over the course of the year is our tolerance level, if you like, for, for putting water onto features or taking it off. So we, we can drop this level quite quickly within, probably within um, five or six days, we could have the water level down and then I could turn the pipe in the opposite direction and drain the feature instead of putting water onto the okay. feature. OK, so you've got complete control uh, through the sluices, through the elbow pipes, and you can adjust the water in different exactly. parts of the system. So, so, so tell me about the wood. What's happening so the wood, there? So the wood in the background you can see here it is also an integral part of the, the, the grazing marsh system here. That was an old duck decoy that was uh, created in a natural low at the, at the base of an Iron Age fort. Mm -hmm. uh, it was created as a duck decoy in the 1700s as a way of, uh, for, the, for the locals to, to shoot and collect uh, wild ducks as a food source. But after about 100 years, that went into disrepair. And uh, that was a very neglected, scraggly old piece of woodland that nobody in conservation mm -hmm. circles had any interest in whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, and until um, 1993, when the grey heron population shifted from Holcomb Park to the wood. Mm. And grey herons have a habit of attracting of other species, and particularly in this modern world where we're ex experiencing global warming species migration, colonisation of, of species from warmer climes. Uh, and that, that happened with Little Egret initially in, in 2002. They, they prospected and nested, mm. and we've had up to 60 pairs in the best year. Mm. And then in 2004, we had spoonbills. Mm. Uh, the, the spoonbill population had obviously disappeared in the UK in the 1600s. And there's still four, ne there's four nesting there now. Yeah, we've still got, some, we've got some late nesting birds yeah. here yeah. already. Yeah. So their population, they started to prospect in 2004, and then in 2010, we actually had a colony of, of six pairs form. Uh, and from six pairs in 2010, we've gone up to 45 pairs in 2002. Uh, so amazing. A, an amazing success story. And, and that wasn't the end of it because we then, we then attracted great white egrets, which had, had never nested in Britain mm -hmm. uh, until they nested in, in Somerset. Uh, in, in, the, in the mid 2000s and then they came here in 2012 we had the first success and they nest in the reed beds that, and they nested in, in, in small willows on the, in, on the reedy ditches okay uh, and then if that weren't enough we then had cattle egrets <laughs> come and prospect uh, and that was about five years ago um, and we peaked last year I think we had 26 young fledge from about a dozen nests so again, a remarkable success story, but and we, we often think, what next? Will it be glossy ibis? Will it be night heron? We, we had, had night heron a couple of. We weeks had a night heron, yeah, two yeah. years ago, um, which we found by chance by doing drone survey work. Uh -huh. So that was yeah, quite exciting. So um, and the interesting thing about that wood is that the the, the levels of the water, uh, the same level. That's all at one in the, in the same system as the ditch level. So when we raise and lower the ditch level. The, the water level in the wood rises and mm -hmm. falls too, uh, which, is, which, which is very important for us to keep an eye on the health of the, the willow trees that you can see growing in the thicket over there, because the willow trees is where the, all these birds nest. And we found after the initial work that was undertaken um, in the late 80s and the 19, early 1990s, because we wanted to create wet fields for nesting lapwings, avocets and red shanks and then for wintering pink-footed geese, widgeon and teal, the, the levels in the wood start to rise dramatically and a lot of the willow trees start to die off. And initially, when there was no bird interest, no one was really too concerned because this was just mm -hmm. a, an, an unwanted piece of mm -hmm. woodland, if you and like. good news. But then the good news story was when every, all these species started to, to arrive and to colonise, and it's now one of the most important nesting colonies for these species in the UK, let alone Norfolk. Mm. Uh, and our success with spoonbills is, is, is mirrored by birds that have now started to colonise colonize other sites all around the UK, uh, East Anglia and even further afield. So a real, a real success story that has, that's been a, an amazing thing for, for me to have witnessed firsthand. And it's still ongoing because uh, we've actually planted another big area and created loads of ditches and islands so that hopefully if the 
we could perhaps in, in another 20 years see that population double in size. It is phenomenal and just to think of what it was like when as a student, you know, been mind boggled to think about all that you've said, all that's arrived here. So the, um, and as I understand it, the way in which uh, the, uh, the reserve works is you, you use the science, but then you reflect every year on what's been done and then you learn from experience and you're continually refining and improving. Is that? Is so that that, right? I always think, you know, I'm old in the tooth now, or getting old in the tooth, and <laughs> we never stop learning and, and, and we should never be naive enough to think that we know everything. And that's all. a lot of these sites have individual um, idiosyncrasies. So it's always good to meet and speak with other people from other sites and you can take some or you can leave some and you have to adapt these things to your own site uh, and that's always a constant learning process particularly with when you get species migration like these new species that some of their requirements are very different from the, the, the wading birds so we, we know that spoonbills like to their close proximity to salt marshes is very important, but they also, when they fledge their young, they like shallow water, to, like this pool here, to, where they can bring the youngsters to, to practice their feeding techniques. And also it's very close by to the nesting colony, so there's an easy route backwards and forwards if danger threatens. So, you know, that, that management of water levels is, is equally important for things like spoonbills, as it is for avocets, lapwings, red shanks, and then obviously the the, the diving ducks and the dabbling ducks in the, in the winter time as well. So the whole thing is, is, a, is a juxtaposition of life that we have to work hard yeah, to try yeah. and, you know, keep, keep in the right. And obviously cattle grazing is very important as well. You know, we'd be lost without cattle grazing mm -hmm. um, because, you know, they, they create the right conditions for it. The summer for the, for the winter and birds, the widgeon, they like the shorter grass to, to graze from and uh, the Brent geese all these species so the whole thing is a web of life that intricately weaves together absolutely and, it, and i think it really does show that the sort of the combination of using science reflecting on what's being done learning from other places makes a real difference and means that there's this huge success that we have here so congratulations on all that's been Thank achieved you. it must it's be very satisfying so well every, every year is different and we know we always have lots to do and that will never stop but thank you.